It's not so long ago that it was assumed that the advent of farming and a settled lifestyle in prehistory brought with it peace, cooperation, and an idyllic Arcadian way of life. Only when copper, bronze, and iron came along, new weaponry ruined that idyll, and the attainment of power through violence released the darker side in us humans. However, studies in recent years and a new paper now tell a very different story. The farming life could actually be a pretty brutal one, it seems. The Prehistory Guys Investigate. I'm just going to read you a few figures uh, here. Now, um, of the skeletal remains of more than 2,300 early farmers from 180 sites dating from around 8,000 to 4,000 years ago, more than one in ten displayed weapon injuries. Uh, this is according to a recent study by uh, Linda Fiebiger, Turban Olstrom, Christian Mayer and Martin Smith. Now, 12.2% of skulls from the Neolithic in Britain from previous studies show signs of violent trauma. 16.9% from Denmark. 7.4% from France, 76 from Germany, 12% from Spain, and 94 from Sweden. Now that's almost 11% overall from the whole of the Northwestern Europe in the Neolithic period. Yeah, and that's the kind of top-line figure that's been quoted in the uh, media uh, as a result of this uh, paper, which was, what, published in October 2022. So, you know, yes, yes. it's so bang it's up to date, study. very recent. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So it's that uh, 10 point... I'm going to be precise here. 10.92 percent. <laughs> 10.92. Yes, yes. How picky can we be? Um, of, of people from the Neolithic in burials showing that they'd been hit over the head or <laughs> yes. been shot through the head in some way. Yes. Um, uh, and I guess when you think about it, yes, that is a very high percentage and, and points to um, uh, <laughs> points to the Neolithic not being quite so pleasant a time to be alive as, as we uh, were once given to believe. But I think, you know, there's a lot of nuance behind that top level figure both for the overall figure and for the figures given for individual areas of Europe and we'll do our best I think to to tease that apart so you you get a um uh, it's a mo it's more of a mosaic picture shall we put it th that way with That's probably a fair way of putting different it, sorts know, of violence yeah. being exercised in different parts of the world at different times you know so so it's it's not all grouped together as this 10.92% mm. figure would have us believe however that said Rupert there's a lot of evidence for horrible goings on particularly earlier on in in, in the neolithic you got a couple of examples there we can dive into uh, to absolutely uh, i i think the one of the worst ones uh, for me anyway is actually one from uh, croatia no, it wasn't worse uh, for you it was pretty dark <laughs> <laughs> bad for them it's true it's true this uh, but we there's a, 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 a massacre in yeah. croatia uh, this is 6,200 uh, years ago, so in what is now Croatia anyway. Mm. And uh, 40 individuals were uh, were massacred and, and just dumped into a small pit. So there's no attempt at tidy burial. These people were just slaughtered and dumped. Um, where should we start here? I mean, uh, uh, Schoenek Killingstaden in yeah. Germany is... Uh, uh, it's a good example that they analyse uh, in this, where uh, it was 26 individuals uh, in this particular uh, massacre. And uh, uh, all these people were uh, were killed by uh, blunt force trauma to the back of the head, um, which seems to be the norm, doesn't it, in, uh, in all these cases? Mm. Sounds like an organised execution in that case, not necessarily the heat of battle or anything like that. Yeah. 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 
we don't want to go too deep on on this, otherwise we'll be here forever. But I mean, throw in a couple of other examples that we've got from yeah. Uh, so yeah, okay. There's another couple of good examples uh, here, and that's uh, there was a uh, they they called it a death pit uh, at uh, Talheim in Germany, and mm. that contained 34 bodies. And then there's another site, Aspen Schletz in Austria. Uh, where there were 67 people massacred in uh, in this place. That's about 5,600 years ago. Mm. Um, and uh, so, yeah, this is all uh, all linear band ceramic uh, period. And um, that that's rather the point. Although these are included in that overall figure, they represent a very particular uh, form of these grisly goings mm. on. Um, because we're talking about the end of the linear band ceramic um, period of their um, culture, and this is before 5000 uh, BC. It's almost as if there was a, you know, the pressures at the end, the, the pressures had built up at the end of uh, the linear band ceramic culture um, period, towards the end of that period, because before that, there is, you know, there, it seems they've all been very nice to each other. You know, ordered burials, uh, uh, reverent um, uh, burials, and, and very little evidence of the kind of things that we're talking about here uh, going on. But just at this end period, um, it all seems to have come to a head. And um, I mean, as you said right at the beginning of uh, uh, of the program, you know, that it had always been thought that the violence really only kicked in uh, with the Bronze Age when people yeah. started defending uh, territory on a, on a more significant scale. But obviously all this new research has just completely thrown that out of the window. Yeah. It's, uh, but it seems that uh, in this particular period, what, in, however you take this, the dogs of war had been unleashed. Uh, and so you've got lots of people sort of... Um, uh, um, going out to deliberately kill, um, you know, yeah. uh, to, to deliberately wipe out um, next door clan or tribe or what have yeah. you. Yeah. yeah, which is not quite the same thing as we see occurring uh, later in in the other numbers from uh, the later Neolithic, and particularly in in Britain uh, and Scandinavia. And um, maybe some of the studies from southern France as well uh, don't tell this kind of story. This is about more individual injury as determined from recovery from um, uh, near the tombs, long bearers and the like. Um, so that's a com it's a completely different story uh, to be told about how people were interacting e we <laughs> with each other on a combative basis. Uh, you know, how much of it was deliberate, how much of it was accidental, uh, what types of weapons were being used uh, in uh, uh, that caused these kind of cranial uh, and long bone fractures that give us the evidence. Uh, yes, because they did... Uh, uh, you know, they analysed a lot of the uh, the injuries, obviously, and uh, and looked at what were the likely weapons used for these, and they included stone axes, adzes, arrowheads, flint knives, uh, wooden and stone headed clubs, as w and antler picks and slingshot as well. You know that uh, um, uh, an antler pick, you know that that'll make a hole in somebody's skull for sure. Yeah, did you know um, there was such a thing as the Thames Beater? <laughs> I didn't tell, tell yes, us about well, the Thames Beater. Talking about you know wooden implements, um, uh, Linda Fieberger has done a separate study, I think, and you know, and that's part of uh, what this study is is based on. Um, but she, I mean, she's the um, um, bioarchaeologist that has done the forensic study on what happens when you hit bone with various things. And one study she did was using the Thames beater, <laughs> which is, uh, uh, hopefully, I'll get a photograph up to show you exactly what it means. It's, it looks pretty much like a rough cricket bat. It's made entirely of wood, you know, with a handle uh, and with a sort of a club end. Um, but she chose that weapon, um, not quite sure why, to see what damage could be done with a, a wooden implement. And she got very um, 
Um, modern utility. Did you know there was such a thing as Simbone? Um, that that's a, a corporate uh, uh, name um, for it, but it's synthetic stuff that you can use in forensics to determine, you know, what happens when you hit bone with stuff. It comes in <laughs> eospheres or it comes wow. in tubes. One to replicate the uh, effect of hitting a skull. One to replicate the effect of hitting. Um, who knew? Like, who knew? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but she, you know, did did the study, and um, yeah, it turns out, you know, that the fractures on the Simbone spheres with the Thames Beta thing uh, matched um, one in particular, but matched quite a lot of uh, uh, injuries uh, recovered from tombs in the study. That's really interesting. Uh, before we move on, uh, do you know what the origin of the name is? That what's the relevance of Thames Beta? Thames in this Thames Beta. I'm guessing know? that this particular one was found in or near the Thames. You would think. Hopefully, I'll be able to put a little uh, <laughs> sidebar up to yeah, tell us more because I haven't got it uh, yeah. in my brain ready to tell okay. you right at this moment. <laughs> interesting. But it, it's, it's an interesting thing that when you look at the injuries uh, that, uh, you know, that they've analysed across, you know, all these cranial injuries and the differences of, uh, of style of weapon, really. And it is an interesting thing that in some cases it does seem to be, uh, you know, the execution of somebody who was already captive hmm. as opposed to somebody who was, uh, you know, killed in a fight. Um, so it, it is, I mean, it's just emphasising the, the point that this is such a violent period. Um, yeah, but, but for whom? That's the important thing to distinguish. Obviously, at the end of the LBK, this was a violent period for the people or some mm. people, you know, for general populations when they're the subject of, of massacre. When we're mm. looking at um, crania and skeletons that have been recovered from uh, tombs, we are assuming that these, of course, are the tombs of the elite. These are not the tombs of ordinary people who've mm. been killed. Uh, so you've got to look at it through a completely different lens as to what the social norms were. Who mm -hmm. was fighting who? Was this taking place in battle or was this taking, you know, were, were these harms taking place in one on one combat? Maybe of a formal kind. Who knows? Or, or even as is the case with the Lusinja uh, massacre in Croatia, that uh, that it, all the evidence seems to point to the fact that these people were just uh, people came uh, just straight into the settlement, wiped everybody out, and uh, and went. There were uh, there were no weapons found at the site at all. So the people clearly yeah. weren't defending themselves. Yeah. They had nothing with which to defend themselves. These, mm. uh, you know, whoever it was that came in, massacred them all and then disappeared. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, again, conjecture. We don't know. But is is it uh, a settlement, a, a territory yeah. uh, thing, you know, that um, it is fighting over territory? Quite possible. Uh, yeah, well, I'm mean, trying to be very, very careful to distinguish between the two types of um, two, two types of uh, violence e exhibited. You know, there's mass violence and the possible mm. um, thing that we're getting from uh, individual tombs that uh, mm. this may be something uh, entirely different. There's an interesting. Absolutely. Uh, well, it's a it's a good distinction, isn't it? That yeah. you you have a mass grave. Mm. Or you have a tomb, and the tomb is clearly built by people who have a reverence for the people who have died, yeah. as opposed to the mass burial where they could have all been tossed in the pit by the people who did the killing just to get yeah. them out of the way. Here's another interesting statistic, though, um, that may inform us. I mean, that number uh, is, uh, you know, f take the British lot, for example, 12.2% of, uh, um, of the skeletal remains show cranial injuries that were a result of blunt or shot force trauma or arrowheads, uh, what have you. 70% um, <clears throat> of arrow injuries and 50% of overall bodily trauma remain invisible in skeletal remains. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and it's a very good point, isn't it? If then if they're not hitting bone, yeah. 
uh, you know. So, what it... percentage of the remainder of uh, skele skeletons that don't show any form of show any form of trauma? What percentage mm. is left that were being killed by other means, by grotting, by uh, bloodletting, yeah. uh, uh, yeah. or or, or so indeed just still so still an arrow, but it didn't hit a bone. Yeah, exactly uh, that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, it's sort of uh, tantalising um, and, and ki kind of worrisome in a way. Well, it, it, it raises you know, the question, uh, you know, exactly the point that you're making, but if you take somewhere like um, Wayland Smithy, yeah. uh, for example, in Gloucestershire, that, um, uh, that tomb, that massive long barrow, contained the remains of just 14 people, four of whom... Uh, died from arrow injury, but that's just according to the skeletal remains, you know. So you raising that point, you know, that well, do we know that the others weren't? Mm. Uh, mm. You know, yeah, that's uh, uh, an interesting uh, an interesting angle as well. That you know, when you look at burials of that scale for such a small number of people clearly held in great reverence to be buried that way mm. do you know I, 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 I'm digressing but uh, but still uh, you know some of the other things that um, uh, that have come up in some of these cases that uh, th there's the pitted wear culture as well um, in uh, uh, now where were they based they were probably predominantly Scandinavia I think am I right in that yeah um, and uh, and an interesting thing with uh, with some of the pitted wear culture uh, uh, traces of injury is that they've even inferred cannibalism from uh, from some of the cuts on bones. Um, I've got to be honest; I haven't looked deeper into that to see what their uh, what their evidence is for for believing that, yeah. but. Um, but you know, it certainly looks more like uh, to them. It looks more like butchery than random uh, yeah. violence. So that's uh, another slightly disturbing angle here. It is, but it's very difficult to discern from that. You know, to take away. You know, it's part of the question of trying to answer. You know, what was life like for ordinary people in mm. the Neolithic? Was it that violent, or was it just you know these things were just occurring as one-offs? I mean, another interesting aspect you know that come out of the Scandinavian end of uh, studies is that um, when arrowheads have been found in bodies as a result that was as a result of conflict or human bodies, they've been in the of the non-tanged, non uh, non-barbed mm. type. Um, yes. Yeah, so that the, the simpler arrowheads seem to have been reserved for interpersonal con uh, yeah, uh, conflict as opposed mm. to the barbed ones, which are specifically for, for hunting. Uh, just a, you know, yeah. <laughs> interesting point that they did make them specially because they it, knew they were going to get It is a very interesting distinction, isn't it? A fight or two, I, I, yeah. I, I don't know enough about weaponry, but it does make you wonder, you know, what's the distinction? Because let's be honest, an, an arrow is going to kill somebody, you know, potentially. Um, you know, is it that the leaf-shaped arrowheads uh, would penetrate deeper? I don't know. I really don't know. But, well, here's, um, here's the thing, you know, because until you do get into the end of the Neolithic and the beginning of the Bronze Age, it's very difficult, difficult to make a distinction between what is a weapon and what is an agricultural tool. Uh, uh, yes. You know, uh, axe heads we normally associate with the cutting down of trees and that kind of thing, chopping up mm. a, a wooden shape, shaping uh, of wood. Uh, mm. Ads is the thing, you know, that you use an ads in the earth for or for um, uh, also for woodwork as well. But blimey, yeah. uh, an ads, which is basically a sideways small axe, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> inflict uh, yeah. just uh, as as much. And mm. because in the Neolithic there is no distinction, you can't distinguish a weapon from from a tool. Mm. Um, uh, and in the same way, also uh, constructions in, in the landscape, you can't determine, uh, because it's completely debatable, what the or original purpose of something in the landscape, like a, you know any earthwork or um, a uh, uh, palisaded, in, uh, palisaded and uh, causewayed enclosure, I should say, more likely, um, mm. was that for defensive purposes, uh, i.e. inferring uh, 
the need to uh, defend against violence, or was it simply mm. um, something that was about cattle or uh, um, um, about agriculture, things like that, or just determination of, mm. of territory? Um, because we can't know, we can't know, we can't uh, infer violence was going to happen from those structures. It's no, tantalising. No, we can't, we can't. But it is an interesting thing, isn't it? When you look at what we know from early history about cattle raiding... Yeah, um, I was going to say... Particularly in Ireland, you know, that, mm. uh, that the cattle raiding is well recorded. And... Uh, so, you know, obviously, cattle. Well, that is a way that you're feeding, uh, uh, you're feeding the uh, the entire settlement. So, if cattle raiding was pretty ubiquitous, then you can imagine that that's that that could explain any number of massacres where people come in. Just let's not have a an unnecessary fight. Let's just ambush these people, get rid of them, and take the cows. Well, I, well, I don't. I don't think that was the way it was going on, though. I don't, you know, when we look at you know massacre sites or mass violence sites, mm. I don't think that's what's going on. Raiding would have involved, I'm sure, you know, interpersonal uh, violence, but it wouldn't have. Yeah, yeah. It's a very different thing entirely. It's almost like it's a given. The cattle raid thing. Mm. It, it gets complicated. I'll quote Martin Smith on this. He says, wealth mm. walks on four legs in the Neolithic. Yeah, yeah. So it's a huge driver. And there are several aspects to, to this, the, the wealth thing um, and the hierarchy and elite uh, thing. Because very early on in the Neolithic, we know now that the elites, uh, the male uh, elites at the top, um, um, well, as Martin Smith says again, uh, polygamy was endemic in the uh, Neolithic, mm. certainly mm. the early Neolithic, as we know from Hazelton North, where yeah. one man uh, had four wives and um, uh, sired enough for you know five generations down. So this mm. whole notion of uh, wealth and hereditary and um, um, uh, uh, and lineage associated with that wealth takes on a really, really powerful aspect uh, in, mm. <laughs> in farming. Not only yeah. that, but he also has been inferring for quite a long time, and I think uh, quite a lot of his academic colleagues have been looking a bit sidelong at him before the discovery of the uh, Hazelton North uh, uh, genetics, is that he had maintained that um, because of the, the uh, polygamy, that in the lower echelons, in the elites, that would have caused a dearth of, of uh, female uh, yeah. partners. And mm. apart from the cattle raiding, there's a distinct possibility that um, the young men were going out in search of women yeah. to the next clan or clans uh, roundabout. And that's going to cause yeah. inter-clan rivalry and revenge yeah. things going on. Yes. And it brings into, also brings into question the use of the word war. Now, they may, it, wars may not have been a, occurring, but from the point of view of a clan, you can be at war with another clan without you being always on the battlefield. Mm. It, that, that war being represented by, oh, he's a blah, blah, blah. Well, we'll, it's constant feuding. Yeah. It's constant feuding, yeah. yeah. So, uh, <laughs> do you know the other fascinating thing, just a complete sidebar of this, you know, uh, how... Uh, can we have a, uh, it's one of the Scandinavian cultures, is actually called the battle axe culture. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that yes. doesn't paint a picture of peaceful, mm. Uh, mm, it doesn't, It does doesn't, it? does it? No, <laughs> no. Have we got an example of what those typical battle axes look like? I'm just thinking, I mean, it's an interesting, you know, for them to be called the battle axe culture. Mm, mm. Anyway, it would be remiss of us uh, both being Brits and uh, me living not far from the Cotswold to be remiss of mm. us uh, in the context of talking about violence, not to mention the Battle of Crickley Hill, don't you agree? Oh, it would. <laughs> it would, yeah, we couldn't possibly not mention Crickley Hill yeah. uh, on so many levels. 
really. Mm-hmm. I mean, I what mean, an amazing place, apart from anything else. Yeah, I mean, Crickley Hill, because we know, but there is another battle site in the Neolithic at uh, Hambledon Hill. We know mm-hmm. less about that. Um, but uh, Crickley Hill, amazing archaeological site. If you live in the vicinity or are visiting, do make a point of, of going there. Wonderful place. But you, mm. if you do go there, then you can really see why that would be a point of conflict. Whoever commanded that point uh, in the geography there on the uh, Cotswold escarpment uh, was always going to be in danger, weren't they, of, of assault Absolutely. from somebody or other wanting to take that position of power? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and it, and it really is a position of power. I mean, it's it might as well be. It's not quite, but it's almost a vertical drop <laughs> um, from the end of this escarpment straight down, and you just have this sweeping view mm. across the landscape beneath you uh, that, uh, yeah, there's not many people would have been able to approach it from that side mm. without being spotted. Mm. Uh, it's a very, very good strategic stronghold. Mm. But it's uh, fascinating from the archaeological point of view how it's been able to, it it can extrapolate from the archaeology that this conflict took place, Rupert. You were going to say about that. Yeah, absolutely. Do you know, it's one of the most exciting pieces of archaeology for me up there that the fact that they found that it was a battle, they could show that it was a battle because. You've got the timber palisades that would have been there Mm. all long since rotted away. You know, every scrap of wood has disappeared over the thousands of years. But there was this row, this line of arrowheads where uh, the attackers had been shooting the uh, arrows, obviously, at, uh, at the defenders. And they'd been hitting the timber palisades and just dropping straight to the ground. Um, or getting stuck and, in the wall and, you know, just coming down. Or getting stuck in the wood the, and then dropping down as the wood decayed. Or um, burnt, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, did they burn it? Yeah, it's just, it is, it's an astonishing site, well worth a visit. Yeah, yeah, it's an absolutely brilliant site. I think we know more about Crickley Hill than we do about uh, Hambleton Hill. But I do know one thing about Hambleton Hill that gives it a sort of little claim to fame and adds a bit of drama to it, that when the pal- when the Palisades uh, collapsed under the assault at uh, uh, Hambleton Hill, uh, two of the defenders were trapped underneath the Palisade. So <laughs> their skeletons were retained and their skeletons did show yeah. signs of um, uh, arrow head damage or, you know, w- whatever. Uh, yeah, so yeah. we've got, uh, you know, this little flashpoint, this little flash of lightning in time that illuminates, uh, you know, yeah. a, a quite a dramatic event. Anyway, yes, that's I- unlucky, isn't it? <laughs> Having your palisades collapse on top of you or being pushed down on top of you yeah, is not a good but, day. Uh, a little bit lucky um, for us. Mm. Uh, anyway, <laughs> true. Anyway, stuff went on in the past. You get the idea. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And yes. Uh, on that bombshell, I think uh, we should draw it to a close. I think uh, we've reached the probably yeah tested yes. the limits of our memory uh, and of uh, and of time, <laughs> your time. Yeah. So um, yes. Yeah, time to draw it to a close there, I think. Thank you so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed that. Um, If you're wondering if there's a a way that you could possibly support us doing what we do, we do have a Patreon page. It'd be great if you could have a look at that. Also, um, we've got uh, plans for a massive five-part series film uh, coming up, and we're sort of asking for help doing that as well. Anyway, there are links to both things down in the description below. It would be great if you could uh, have have a look. As I say, thanks for watching. It's uh, bye for now from me. And a goodbye from me. Thanks again. (laughs) Cheers for now. Bye-bye.